free choice in a way uh, that you have uh, one of these two is likely to be president unless Evan McMullen brings it to the House some way. Yeah. One is worse than the other, and and you kind if of you, hold your nose. Right. So so two things. If you feel that Hillary Clinton is is definitely going to be a better president than Trump, then you vote for Hillary Clinton. If you feel Trump is going to be a better president than Hillary, then vote for Trump. If I were to swing state, I still wouldn't be voting in this election. And the reason is this: I think that Trump would probably be a less damaging president for the next four years than Hillary Clinton. But I think that he's going to rip the heart out of the conservative movement. So the analogy that I use is we're traveling toward the cliff. At 100 miles an hour, we were at 30, and then Obama rammed the pedal to the metal. And now, if Hillary were to take over, she'd move us to 130 toward the cliff. Trump would move us to 110 toward the cliff. So it would still be worse. But he would also rip out the reverse gear. So morally, I can't, I'm can't. i not going to vote for a woman who's pro-partial birth abortion. And politically, I'm not going to vote for a guy, and morally, I'm not going to vote for a guy who has said and done all the things that Trump has done and who is perverting the only movement that's capable of saving the country in the long run, it's going to be important that there were pe- four years from now, it's going to be very important that there were people who said no to Trump. Because I promise you, when the media comes after Paul Ryan and says, you're running for president now, Congressman or Speaker Ryan, and you back Donald Trump when he was saying that Mexican judges couldn't properly, you, you backed a textbook racist in your own words. You know, how's that going to play in a general? Is, is that going to play any decently? No, of course, it's going to be a disaster in a general. So, you know, I understand the, the, the here's why I don't buy the binary logic. I don't buy the binary logic because I don't think that a vote is just an instrument of policy. If you think that a vote is just like a coupon, that it expires on January 1st, and so you may as well use it. It doesn't matter how crappy the story is. You may as well use it. You you use it or lose it, right? Then it's a binary choice. You may as well cast your ballot for the person who you think is going to be best for the next four years. Some people think it's Hillary because they think Trump is unstable. Some people think it's Trump because they think that Hillary is stable and wildly leftist. Understand all that. There's another truth about voting that people don't want to recognize, and that is that people attach a moral value to the vote. It's not just an instrument of policy. When someone tells you that they voted for Jill Stein, you make a judgment about them. When someone tells you they voted about for Bernie Sanders, you make a judgment. If someone told you they voted for George Wallace, you would make a moral judgment. If someone tells you they voted for Bill Clinton, you make a moral judgment. The idea that voting doesn't carry with it a particular moral stigma is a mistake. And it's particularly true for public figures. So it may not be true if you're just Joe Schmo living in Iowa. But if you're, if you're somebody who spends every day talking about these issues, like you or me or any of the public figures that, that are in this area, your vote means more, obviously, than your vote. And the, and the proof is in the pudding, right? I mean, who cares about my vote? I'm in California. The only reason people say that they care about how I vote is because they're taking that as a signal of disapproval. They should take it as a signal of disapproval. I disapprove of both of these candidates. So that's why I say it's not binary. For, for people for whom going public about your vote matters, it's obviously not binary because there's a standard by which... And, and this is true for all, all the people who say it's binary. Even they acknowledge it's not really binary. Like I asked Dennis Prager this once. Dennis is on the – he's voting for Trump, and, and he has very we, – we strenuously disagree on this. And he, he was kind enough to have me on his show. And one of the things I said is, can you imagine an election where somebody is running who would be less bad than the leftist in office, but you couldn't vote for them? And he said, well, give me an example. I said, okay, David Duke, right? David Duke's running for Senate in Louisiana. Would you vote for David Duke for the Senate in Louisiana? Maybe he's the 60th vote for, for Donald Trump's presidential, uh, for, for his constitutional uh, Supreme Court justice. Do, do you vote for him or against him? And then I said, well, I'd, I'd have to vote against him. And I said, well, why? I mean, he, he wouldn't be able to do much. I mean, he, his racism presumably would be stopped in the Senate. You know, most of the other senators aren't racist, so why? And so I couldn't bring myself morally to do that. And he said, well, but Trump isn't David Duke. And I said, right, but my standard isn't David Duke. Meaning that, you know, my, my standard for who deserves my support, who earns my support is higher than just the person who's slightly better than Hillary Clinton on policy. You mentioned the future. So that brings me to a Twitter question from a handle called Wagonator. If you could pick any two people alive to run for president and VP in 2020, who would it be? Uh, well, I mean, I've said before that I think that, that Thomas Sowell, if he could run, <laughs> would be spectacular. I don't I think the politicians actually make poor presidents, <laughs> at least in the modern era. Uh, it, it's you know trying hard to come up with some names. I mean, there there's some governors who've done a good job. I think Greg Abbott's done a very good job in Texas, obviously. Um, but you know, in terms of who would make a good candidate, somebody who can speak intelligently on the issues, not make a lot of big boo boos, and speak morally. That's why I say you know Thomas Sowell, for example. You know, it, I'm, I'm hard pressed to come up with specific names. Um, but you know, any of the commentators who I think speak morally would be would be great. But you know whether they whether none of them are ever going to run, of course. But the, that's that's sort of the fun in picking people out of the ether. As far as politicians who are out there, I think there are a lot of politicians who'd be interesting to look at. But I haven't spent enough time looking at them yet because we're four years in advance. So you know, I, I like what I see from people like Ben Sass. Uh, I like what I see from, as I mentioned, Greg Abbott and Abbott supporting Trump. So this is not a matter of support or not support of Trump. Um, yeah, they're, they're, 
there there's some things to recommend Tom Cotton. I'll think although I think that that Cotton is is a little bit more dicey for me, uh, just in terms of if you've ever seen him speak, he's not the most captivating speaker, and that that does matter in in presidential elections. But there are a lot of very good people, and and I think that. We're going to have to be careful next time not to – every primary season, we just rip each other down. And by the time we hit the general election, everybody's been burned to the ground. Uh, another Twitter question from a handle called Chugalug. Who is the next celebrity CEO who tries to do politics? I think Mark Cuban obviously has an inkling that he'd like to do it. We've already had uh, – I think Peter Thiel might, might try to do something. He's gotten very politically involved. He's doing a speech at the end of the month about Trump. I, I wouldn't be surprised if – some of these, if, if you see more of this, not less. I mean, well, the celebrity politician has become a thing now. I mean, and, and you can come out, I mean, anybody can run. So that, that's so you're, you're going to see more of that. There will be more people who are not traditional politicians running for president, which could be good if they're good, but it could be really bad if they're bad, like Trump. Is there any scenario where you could imagine as bad as most conservatives think Hillary's going to be, where she surprises and does things that make her a more palatable president? Well, I mean, I think that the, the only good news, the only silver lining about Hillary at all is that Hillary's going to be a very weak president. She's not going to be a strong president. Nobody likes her. She's corrupt. Her own party dislikes her. She'll probably go in with a Republican House. There's a good possibility, you know, maybe a 50% shot that she goes in with a Republican Senate. Uh, she then has an off-year election, which is never good for the incumbent party. So, And, and this, this year is very hard for Republicans because they have more swing seats up. That's not true two years from now. She could be really hamstrung on a lot of stuff, and a lot of the stuff that she wants to do requires congressional approval as opposed to executive power. You know, areas where I think that they, they, listen, I think there are a couple of areas where she's to the right of Trump. I think she's to the right of Trump on trade. Clearly, Trump is Trump is a Bernie Sanders anti-trade and uh, and on foreign policy. There's a case to be made that she's more hawkish than Trump is because he's a Pat Buchanan isolationist in his heart. So it's you know that she's going to be quite awful on religious liberty. That's the one that I'm most worried about. She's awful on religion. She's awful on religious liberty. Uh, she'll be terrible on spending and taxes. But again, in order to raise taxes, you need some congressional approval. She'll be rotten on immigration. But, you know, I, I honestly don't think Trump was going to be wonderful on immigration. I was for a while before Trump was. I'll be for a while after he isn't anymore. And so, you know, the, the, the idea that Trump was going to be some sort of great shakes on immigration, that he was going to give the, that he was going to follow the Jeff Sessions plan to a T. That's expecting a lot of a guy who, who, reneged on Jeff Sessions's plan when asked one question about it in a primary debate. Well, I, th you raise an interesting question of what she will be good and bad on. Obviously, she won't be particularly great on judges. Oh, uh, she'll be garbage on but, judges. But so my, so my question is, Republicans what, should what, stonewall her on every judge she puts up. Exactly. So should we should they just try to keep a 4-4 court uh, yes. indefinitely? Yes. And one of the things that I found it was I had this conversation with Hugh Hewitt because Hugh has made his entire spiel now about the court and the judges. And what I said to him is, you know, in order for Trump to even ram through a, a judge that would be really good on the Supreme Court, a couple of things have to be true. One, he has to know what that looks like. Two, he needs Mitch McConnell to invoke the nuclear option because, you know, the Democrats are definitely going to filibuster anybody who remotely looks like a Thomas or Scalia or even an Alito. They're going to filibuster that person. So if they if they filibuster that person, does anyone really think that th the whole premise of this election is that Mitch McConnell is a weakling and so is Paul Ryan? And now you're expecting him to become the lion of the Senate and invoke the nuclear option or to ram through a Trump judicial pick? No, they'll put up somebody from the list. That person would go down in flames. And then he would come back with a highly qualified person of no specified ideology who's a stealth candidate and ends up being David Souter. You know, that's 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 the way that the court was going to go anyway. Uh, also, when I was talking to Hugh, I said, you know, I don't understand. You say that Mitch McConnell could reject any Trump nominee who's not constitutionally conservative. You know, you say that, but then you also say that Mitch McConnell should give Hillary Clinton's nominee an up or down vote. I don't understand that at all. You're saying he's going to be a lion when it comes to Trump, but he should be a lamb when it comes to Hillary. You know, it's it's always been my view that that you you do not abdicate your constitutional responsibilities just because an election has taken place. Mitch McConnell was not elected to give an up or down vote to Hillary Clinton's judicial nominees. He was elected to fulfill his constitutional obligations, which in this case means not allowing an up or down vote on a wild left nominee that Hillary puts forward. Let's talk a little bit about foreign policy, because I know, like uh, like me, you care about foreign policy mm -hmm. uh, and you care about Israel and the U.S. as a relationship like me. What, what is your overall view of uh, obviously, uh, I imagine you don't think there's a peace deal in the offing anytime uh, Ever. at the moment. No, there, there yeah, what's, your, what's your end? What's your end game? What do you what there's do you, no end game. There's no utopia. I, I, when I was younger, I used to get involved in these kind of utopian schemes, which brought me to the brink of moral and philosophical disaster. Uh, and I've had to backtrack on those and it's not really a backtrack it's 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 in as they like to say an evolution um but you know the fact is that you're going to get basic stasis and security there and that's the best you can hope for there's never going to be any sort of real solution because one side wants to murder the other side and that's not going to stop until there's a religious change 
uh, in one side. One side just wants to live there. They don't care whether, like, Tel Aviv is the same to them as Jerusalem. And the, the idea the Palestinians are ever going to accept a peace deal and then live side by side in peace and harmony is just short-sighted and idiotic. What, what about, I mean, you know, Michael Oren's, ba- I, he was one of our original guests on the podcast. Mm-hmm. He's kind of, I don't know if he really talks about the unilateral solution anymore, but he, he mm-hmm. at one point it mm-hmm. was, you know, define borders, put, a, put the fence there. Um, and say, here's and your state. Yeah. Here's a state. Tell the settlers that are on the other side of the fence, time to come back, mm-hmm. push them back. And this is the, the two-state solution. Well, I mean, I think that there's some merit to that idea. I think that the problem with that idea, of course, is that once you say it's your state, presumably they have control over the borders in their state or you're in a state of war. I mean, it's a, then, then you're talking about a quote-unquote occupation, right? The biggest problem is they start shipping in weapons immediately. Well, I mean, it'll be semi, it'll be it's semi-sovereign. Okay, but so it's so semi-autonomous yeah. now. They just don't call it a state. I mean, it, that's, that's what it is exactly now. Whether you call it a state or not a state, that's de facto what it is. Right? I mean, they have their own police force. All the police force have guns. The, the West does not allow them to ship in weaponry. Uh, that's against international law right now. But, you know, were, were the Israelis to, you know, give them statehood, presumably the next step would be, okay, well, why can't you treat us like any other state? Why can't you open our borders? If we're a state, we should have control. I mean, I guess you can change the name of it. I don't really see how that, that changes anything. I mean, if you really want to do that, then what you really do is you just wall off Gaza, say, okay, here's your state, and you don't get anything anything in Judea and Samaria because it's too close to everything, and having a, a there's no such thing as a contiguous Palestinian state because obviously the the geography just doesn't allow for it. Yeah, well, there, there was a discussing of a bridge at one point. Oh, yeah, <laughs> and this is all this is all nonsense. Yeah. Uh, so to Israel's north, of course, there's some some trouble there, specifically in Syria. How do you envision what should you, the United States' role be in the Syrian civil war? Well, I mean, I think that the, right now the the role should be it's it's a little late to try and to try and do anything substantive. I mean, it's it's, it's you know I'll, I'll admit that when we first started talking about arming the Syrian rebels that I was concerned, as was Ted Cruz and many other people, about the the idea that we don't have any clue who these people are, and we have a not wonderful history of arming rebel groups, and those rebel groups turning out to have ties with terrorists. And in fact, some of the Syrian rebel groups do have ties with terrorists, obviously. I, I actually think that you know establishing a no-fly zone and then setting up refugee havens in countries like Turkey and paying countries to take in Syrian refugees is probably the only viable solution at this point. The idea of, of arming the Syrian rebels, I just don't know that that's particularly viable because again a lot of the syrian rebels are people that we don't recognize and it's all fun and games until they until it turns out that they're another offshoot of al-qaeda i want to turn to some career questions in a second but before i do you have a uh, pretty interesting story about you and elizabeth warren and uh, how uh, you ended up going to harvard law i mean so I, I you know did well on my lsats and had good grades and had written a book and so i was offered admission to harvard law and then they had a, a meeting well, really a get together at uh, at the top of the W Hotel in Westwood, and uh, that was the first time I met now Senator Warren. Uh, and who's then a Harvard Law professor? She was a Harvard Law property professor, and they brought her out as kind of a recruitment person. And uh, and she must have read kind of my my resume beforehand because it wasn't tons of people; it was probably thirty people or something. Uh, and uh, and so she said something like, "I see that you wrote this conservative book about brainwashing on college campuses." And uh, do you really think that happens? Yes, I do. And she says, well, you know, do you, you do you, li- uh, you, you probably just listen to talk radio. And I said, well, I mean, I do listen to talk radio. She said, you know, that, that Rush Limbaugh, he's just, he's just awful. I said, well, have you ever listened to Rush Limbaugh? And she said, no. And I said, well, right. I mean, uh, that's like, how do you know? <laughs> and she, she didn't really have a, a solid comeback for that. But, you know, that's sort of the leftist bubble that exists. The, the fun thing about Harvard Law is that you run into all these people, right? I mean, Elena Kagan, who's now justice, was the dean then. And literally the only thing that she was famous for was building an ice skating rink at Harvard Law. That was legitimately her claim to fame, is that she put an ice skating rink outside of the, outside of the student union. So, oh, and also tried to, uh, and also tried to force the federal government not to pull money from the, from the law school over banning ROTC. Uh, let's turn to uh, kind of career advice to people who might be listening to this who want to be the next Ben Shapiro. If someone I don't know comes, why they'd want to, but if, sure. If, if someone comes to you and says, Ben, I want to, I want to follow in your footsteps. I want to be the next uh, great pundit at a very young age. I think 17, you got a syndicated column. Yeah. What would you advise them? Read and read and read and read and read. And and then write and write and write and write and write. And do and acknowledge that, that you're going to have to go through the the – Miners for a very long time with very little recognition and slog along for very little pay. I mean, that's that's sort of the the rule. Like the syndicated column has never paid a lot of money. It was something that I did almost for free because I think it was important to get the message out. I wrote for many years. I mean, I've been doing this. I'm 32 now, so I'm doing this for 15 years. And you know, there there are moments where people sort of pay attention to the stuff you're saying, and there's a lot of moments where they don't. But it's 
it's all preparation for for the time when you finally get a shot at at sort of being in front of a lot of people and then you take advantage of that shot. So, you know, for me there have been, you know, a number of times where I've been able to do that and that's that's been helpful, but that's that's about preparing for years in advance for that for a, a moment that comes along rarely. Would you recommend to someone they get involved and try to become a commentator at an early age like you did? Uh sure. I mean, I, I think that's there, there's nothing wrong with that. I think that you know, digging the, the best way to do it now when I was younger it, the, the political situation was a little different there was a little more of a scarcity in terms of the conservative books were not there wasn't such a glut of them back when I went back when I started uh, it was it was still sort of a, a new idea that we were going to have an entire industry of conservative books there, the main publisher then was Regnery there was no crown forum there was no uh, you know Harper Collins really didn't do it uh, and uh, and so it grew over time now in order to break in you need to do some reporting so I, I talk to college students all the time they all have my email address I have them send me resumes I try to funnel them to places they want to work internships and places on the hill and and we tr- if we have we're going to try and start an internship program at Daily Wire specifically to work with college students I like to help young people out on this if you really want to make a name for yourself in this particular sphere report on what's going on on your campus get the word out to people like me we'll help blow it up I'm happy to help get you on Fox News I'm happy to help bring attention to issues that you're seeing on campus because you, as Andrew Breitbart who's one of my mentors said you know you are a reporter you have a, a phone on you have a camera on your phone that makes you a reporter now so everybody's got an opinion not a lot of people have information. Focus on the information, and then people will want your opinion the more information you're giving them. You mentioned you've been in uh, this game for 15 years now. How, how have your views changed from when you started in, or in, on any issue, or if they haven't? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm more libertarian on some issues. I think that uh, I'm, I didn't used to be pro-marijuana legalization. I'm pro-marijuana legalization because I think the government sucks at everything. Any other drugs or just marijuana? Not any drugs that have externalities. So meaning like if there are certain drugs that make people legitimately violent. Those drugs, no. I'm right where you – that's exactly my – Yeah, I mean it, but it, any drug that doesn't have externalities, if it's just a matter of you're using a drug to, for your own personal high, I think you're adult. I think you're a moron. You annoy me. But since I'm not a fascist, you can be adult, a moron, and annoy me and not go to jail. That's, yeah. that's my basic rule of, of government. It's so kind of the John Stuart Mill uh, argument. Yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to government policy, the John Stuart Mill argument is exactly correct. I think the problem with the libertarians is they take the John Stuart Mill argument to the social sphere, too. And then they say churches, and this is not all libertarians. Some say yeah, churches are bad, that, that social institutions are bad. No, you need the social fabric in order to provide the framework for a John Stuart Mill government to work. Yeah, t- to date, you have uh, mainly written nonfiction books, mm-hmm. uh, but you have a fiction book coming out, True Allegiance, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, what is that about? When does it come out? Why? Why fiction instead of nonfiction? So, the, the, so to start with, uh, where it's coming out November first in print. Uh, you can get that uh, at Amazon. It should be at your local bookstore as well. It's an imprint of Simon and Schuster, uh, and it's a uh, and and the book is basically a take on what the collapse of the republic would look like in in sort of an alternative reality where everything is uh, is it, all, all the all the spinal tap scales are inched up to eleven as opposed to where they are now, which is about nine point three. So, if if things got worse on kind of all fronts, how does that impact the republic? And how does that fall apart in the in the guise of an action thriller? The reason that I wrote it as an action thriller as opposed to writing just a nonfiction book about what's going to happen when things fall apart is because you write nonfiction and you actually get more argument, not less, uh, because people argue with your sources, they argue with your facts, they, they suggest that you're cherry-picking statistics and all the rest of it. And that may be right or it may be wrong. I'm, I'm happy to argue about all of those things. But the nice thing about the narrative is that it, it conveys the message that there are crises in certain areas of American life that have to be addressed, and there is a moral to these crises. Fiction is about morals, and nonfiction is about information. And I think that the Republican Party needs to move from the information party to the moral party, and that means telling stories. And so the easiest way to tell a story is sometimes to provide an example of what could happen. Here's the story that we're going to tell. Atlas Shrugged taught more people about capitalism than, than Milton Friedman. Certainly more people have read Atlas Shrugged than have ever read a book by Milton Friedman. Uh, so that, you know, uh, carrying that same sort of idea forward, you know, the, the book has various storylines. There's a crisis on the border in which the, 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 the Texas-Mexico border is being used as a go-between for Mexican drug cartels, and the Texas governor says, we've had enough of this, we're not listening to the federal government anymore on this. Uh, you have the federal government encroaching on land rights and uh, standoffs between the federal government and farmers. Uh, you have a, uh, a race riot that rages out of control in a major city. I wrote a lot of this, like, a couple of years ago before some of these things had happened. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, and so it, I thought this is like 20 years in the future. Now it appears to be about 10. Um, but it's, uh, there's a race riot in a major city, and the president of the United States essentially 
hands the city over to the, the race rioters instead of trying to fight back against it or even calm it. Uh, and, uh, and meanwhile, there are terrorists attempting to hit the homeland as the United States withdraws from all these places around the world. And the hero, obviously, is trying to stop all this from, from breaking loose. Did you find writing fiction harder than nonfiction? It's definitely harder. I mean, nonfiction, you're working off of other people's work a lot of the time. I mean, most, most nonfiction is not pure reportage. I've done that book. I mean, I, when I did Primetime Propaganda, that was a lot of reportage. Uh, that was a book about TV, and I went and interviewed everybody in the TV industry. But most nonfiction that gets written is you sitting there and doing research on secondary sources or primary sources that are written. And so you're quoting a lot. Uh, you're relying on other people's research. You're citing statistics that other people have compiled, and then you're formulating those into compelling arguments. Uh, that's a lot easier than writing a term paper is a lot easier than coming up with a plot and characters directly out of your head. Uh, and then trying to you know make the plot compelling enough to 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 work, you actually have to work out holes in in plot that you wouldn't have to in nonfiction. Twitter question: Realistically, what are the chances of Ben ever running for elected position? <laughs> you know, apparently anyone can do it. So, you know, I, I don't rule anything out. But if 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 Herman Cain and Ben Carson and Donald Trump can be seen as viable candidates for higher office, then. Uh, I, I don't see why we shouldn't have more people running for higher office who are capable of, of making decent conservative arguments that are convincing, particularly to young people. I should say that Twitter question came from a someone named Andrew Hall. All right, let's go to uh, some closing questions. I always like to close with some fun questions. What historical figure do you most admire? Uh, I mean, everyone says Churchill. You know, Moses, Adams, Churchill, Lincoln would be the big four for me. What three books most shaped your worldview? Uh, the Bible, Economics in One Lesson, and the Federalist Papers. Is there a writer or are there writers that when you see their byline, you always read them? Sure. I mean, I, it's changed over time. There are some people who I used to read a lot more regularly who I don't anymore, uh, thanks to this particular election cycle. But uh, in terms of books, I always read Tom Wolfe when he has a new book out. I read it. Adam Carolla, when he has a new book out, I read it because he's hysterically funny. Uh, and uh, in terms of kind of people who write regularly in, in online, uh, whenever I see David French has a piece, I, I love David French's work at National Review. There are actually a fair number of, of writers who I, who I really enjoy, even people I disagree with. Uh, anybody uh, you can mention who you disagree with on, on the other side? Who I enjoy reading? Yeah, and everything Nate Silver writes I read, yeah. uh, I've, I've, and I disagree with him on politics strenuously. Who is the most overrated person in Washington? <sighs> I mean, it's hard. That, that's uh, An easier question would be who's not overrated in Washington. <laughs> um, it's the most overrated person in Washington on their side of the aisle is President Obama, who is who's been an absolutely destructive force, but is not quite as competent as people make him out to be. And, uh, and on our side, uh, I think the most overrated person is Paul Ryan. I think Paul Ryan is, is deeply overrated. Really? Uh, yeah. Uh, and the reason I say Paul Ryan is deeply overrated is I don't know what he's done. Like, I know, that, I, know that he's, I know that he's said a lot of good things, but I'm not sure what he's actually done. And his approach to politics is not mine. I, I, I think that uh, this doesn't make him bad, by the way. Yeah. I, I think that, that Paul Ryan is a, is a decent conservative uh, I think that he, he gets a lot of crap for stuff he doesn't deserve. I think he doesn't get crap for some things he does deserve. Yeah. But his approach to politics that seems to be beloved by all these people on our side of the aisle is a really milk toast approach to politics that's not slated to win anything. Let, let me just play devil's advocate sure. very quickly here. What some people would say Paul Ryan did, and one of those people are upset with him during this election for standing behind Trump, but is that you know the Republican Party – was until he kind of forced them, not really talking about entitlement reform. Right, so he that got was the good. Entire, that he got was the good. entire House uh, and Senate to vote on a, a, an entitlement reform and get, get them on board when people used to say it was a third rail because they didn't want to get right, involved. Right, no, and, that and, and that was an act of political courage. It also didn't pass because the fact is that you, you have it did to— pass, It did pass the House, I think. Right, it, no, it passed the House, but a yeah. lot of things passed the House. Repeal of yeah. Obamacare passed the House yeah. with John Boehner as the head of the House, right? I mean, like, they, like a lot of things passed the House. Did entitlement reform pass the Senate? Uh, I, I don't. I don't think. I'd have to go back and. Um, but I, I don't remember, honest, to be honest with you. But the the reason. So the dirty little secret of politics is that yes, it takes courage to talk about entitlement reform, and there he deserves lots and lots, and he deserves an enormous amount of credit. That said, he does it on the basis of efficiency, and he doesn't do it on the basis of morality. And Republicans, th this is my biggest problem with Paul Ryan, is that he talks politics on the basis of what works and what doesn't work. He doesn't do it on the basis of what's right and wrong. And Republicans always do this, and it's a huge mistake. People don't vote on the basis of what works and what doesn't work. If they did, Barack Obama would have lost overwhelmingly in 2012. Right? People vote on the basis of what they feel is right and wrong. They vote on the basis of their own, their own perception of moral superiority. And if you never talk the language of ethics and morals, and instead you just talk about, we will be fiscally insolvent, 
You know how many Americans know what either of those words means, fiscally insolvent? I mean, it's, it's really low. But if you say it is wrong to rip away the future of Americans by redistributing wealth to older Americans who are, who are still in the workforce now, not to people who have already been made promises, but people who are 35, 40 now, it's wrong to saddle people who have not yet been born with their Social Security when these people could very simply put their money in the stock market and be responsible with their money. That's theft. It's intergenerational theft. If you say that, that's a moral argument that at least people can, can argue with. They can at least grasp that. That's a lot better than we have 20 – when people say we have $20 trillion in debt and then they're shocked. Republicans are shocked. No one cares because no one knows what trillion means. Like what does that mean to you? What, what, what would you do with a trillion dollars? How is it different from a billion, right? I mean like, yeah. like the, the, the idea that anyone can wrap their minds about, around figures that large. And even when you say things like, well, if you just took the $100 bills and stacked it up to the moon and back, that still doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Right? These are numbers that don't mean anything. They're just numbers. But if you say we will have to be – we pay the entire budget of the Chinese military every year in just the interest payments on the national debt. And that's immoral because we're paying for the army of a country that forces abortions on its own citizens, right? And that is egregiously violating the human rights of surrounding countries. And we're paying for that because we're too selfish not to take out further borrowing on, on welfare programs that are ruining the economy anyway. Now you're making an actual moral argument that might be able to convince somebody. Legacy question, and you're young, so this might be a little bit difficult. Thomas Jefferson famously only one of the three things on his tombstone that he founded UVA, that he wrote the Declaration of Independence and the Virginia Statue on Religious Freedom. Decades and decades from now, when you leave this mortal coil, what three things would you like to see on your uh, tombstone? Well, I mean, I think obviously most important to me is father and, and husband. But beyond that, lived a virtuous life would be a good one. Uh, as far as accomplishments, you know, I hope that the best accomplishments are yet to come, but if, if it was inspired people to fight back against the left, I think that would be a, a pretty good one. If people who are listeners to this want to uh, read your work, hear you, where can they go? So Ben Shapiro Show is my podcast that comes out daily, Monday through Thursday. We should add a Friday show pretty soon. Uh, it's the largest conservative podcast in the country. We have about 150,000 people who download it every day. If, uh, if you want to subscribe to that, also become a subscriber at Daily Wire. You can see it in real time, and we, we do a mailbag, and you can chat and all that, and you can get a free copy of True Allegiance signed if you, if you do an annual subscription to Daily Wire. And uh, that's the place to read most of my writing. I also write once a week at National Review. I have a syndicated column at National Review. I write four times a day for Daily Wire. Then I have books and speeches. So uh, if, if you want to have some fun, I recommend also that you check out. There's some random guy. I have no idea who he is. Uh, he put out these Ben Shapiro Thug Life videos <laughs> that are on YouTube that have become very popular, and, uh, and they're kind of a kick. Uh, ben, thanks for doing this. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Jamie Weinstein Show. If you did, I would be forever grateful if you shared it with your friends and family. Most importantly, please, please, please subscribe to the podcast and leave a review of it on iTunes. If you want to see more of my work, check out jamieweinstein.com and follow me on Twitter at Jamie underscore Weinstein, where you can tweet me a question which I just might use in a future podcast interview. Thanks for listening.